Today we're laying out the field and we've got it measured length by width. We've got a nice seed bed prepared. We're doing a sort of semi-scientific trial to evaluate several different varieties of non-GMO sugar beets. And uh, the reason we're doing this is that there's really not a, a very strong regional base for knowledge about different sugar beet varieties. You know, sugar beets have been around as a crop for several hundred years, a lot longer than GMOs. And uh, there's no reason to think that we can't uh, recreate sugar as a viable regional crop without um, Monsanto. This is, this is from Shumways, and um, it's giant half sugar type. And um, this is actually from Elk Mound, the, the monster, monster buck sugar beet seed, and it's for deer plots for people to bait deer so that they can gun them down. And uh, these ones that have the coating on them, I actually uh, had smuggled in from Scotland because I couldn't get any uh, fodder beets. And fodder beets tend to be bigger and somewhat lower in sugar content than sugar beets, um, but might actually produce more sugar per acre in northeastern systems than sugar beets. We, we don't really know and it's worth a try. This last one uh, is a non-GMO variety that was provided to us by uh, Beta Seed, which is a uh, Western um, industrial type uh, seed outfit. And uh, we're gonna use this push seeder along with stakes and strings and push the rows of seed, uh, lay them down one row at a time. Uh, so we're gonna have 30 rows, 500 feet long and then over the course of the season, after the plants are established, we'll be cultivating in between them with the horses. We planted around April 15th, I believe. And we planted an entire acre in the beets. And uh, the field is gently sloping and the upper part is slightly better drained than the lower part. The seeds hadn't begun to germinate before the weather got cold and wet. And it stayed really cold and really wet. And the lower part of the field was totally waterlogged for about two weeks. So only really in the upper third of the field was what you would describe as, as good germination, where there were enough beets to fill in every row. I think I'm going to focus on the part of the field where the germination was adequate. We'll take maybe like one row of each variety from the upper portion of the project, the upper, upper third of an acre or so, and we'll measure the yield for that amount of row feet and then we can extrapolate what the yield would have been on an entire acre. So one of the reasons why farmers in New England often don't consider beets is that uh, the harvesting techniques are a little involved and the heavy commercial equipment for harvesting beets is not common or even well known in this region. What I was able to find was a horse-drawn beet lifter plow and what it is, is uh, a very narrow plow that has a sole that kind of runs underneath the root and uh, ruptures the soil underneath it and makes the beets uh, much easier to pull out. You could probably approximate the same effect of a beet lifter plow with a small walking plow. Uh, just rip a little furrow alongside the beets uh, both sides and that would work almost as well. Uh, obviously anybody contemplating sugar beets as a commercial crop can't consider forking the beets out one at a time. For field beets there's really three separate classes. Mangles are used pretty much exclusively for animal fodder and they grow really large and really pithy and um, they grow entirely on the surface. Uh, and sugar beets grow almost entirely below the surface. They tend to be white in color, whereas the mangles can be usually yellow or red. Um, and they're higher in sugar. Fodder beets are somewhere in the middle. 
They're good for animal fodder, but they may also have sugar making or ethanol making uh, potential that hasn't been adequately considered. So I really wanted to include fodder beets in the trial. Um, and uh, they, they are kind of fun. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, fodder beets are easier to harvest on a small scale because they grow on the surface kind of like a palm tree and uh, you know, like only the ground would be about where my hands are so it's pretty easy to uproot by hand whereas the sugar beets uh, are kind of like torpedoes going down into the earth and it's much more effort to pull them out you need uh, a specialized tool or a heck of a lot of time with a fork to unearth each one individually but we don't have a bunker silo, so we built this clamp. And the expectation is we're just going to store the beets here for a month, maybe two. And then um, in December or January, I'm going to unearth them and start processing them into sugar. Uh, so this is just an interim storage solution. If, uh, if we wanted to, we could... Um, start the sugar making process right now, but uh, we kind of need to pause between steps. This is the sugar beet dug up from the clamp and uh, they kept pretty well in storage. Um, and then they have to be uh, washed in the next step. And the most efficient way we found to wash them is to soak them overnight in drums of water and then just give them a quick clean Certainly if we were to ramp this up any larger than the scale that we're doing it, we would definitely need a heavy duty root washer and that would cut down quite a bit on the labor inputs. We've developed two methods for processing the sugar beets and the one that is faster and, and is more effective at getting the sugar out of the beet is a heavy duty homeowner grade vegetable juicer. We push the beads through it and it separates the liquid in the beet from the pulp. The beets are about 80% liquid and the juicer removes most of that and most of the sugar along with the liquid. And using the juicer we can uh, produce about a gallon of uh, beet juice every two to three minutes. One of the end uses for the pulp that has come to light since we began the work is uh, that some horse owners won't feed GMO beet pulp to their animals and uh, non-GMO beet pulp is currently available in the US only as an import from Europe and is quite expensive on a per pound basis. Yeah. It's also another reason for the farmer to do the processing of the beets. Yeah. It's something that you can use on the farm right away in its raw state, and it's also something that the yeah. farmer could dry and market themselves. The second method that we developed is uh, a diffusion method, and that's more similar to the way sugar beets are processed into sugar in the industry. Uh, we accomplish it here on a small scale by chopping the beets up small and steeping them in hot water over a long period of time. And with this method, we found that the beet flavor is much less um, obtrusive than it is uh, with uh, the juicer. Our problem with the diffusion method is that it requires heating up a lot of beet mass to a high temperature, and it, it's very slow for the amount of liquid that you get out of it. The syrup that results from the diffusion process is right here. And it has only a very subtle beet flavor to it. Whereas uh, here's this other syrup. This is from the juicer method. And you can see how dark that is in comparison. That's an indication that when we get to crystallization stage, we're going to have a lot of compounds that are standing in the way of effective crystallization and are going to be expressed as molasses. The beet flavor is way too much in your face. It's it's sort of like, imagine like blackstrap molasses combined with Swiss chard, and that's pretty much the flavor. Basically what, the, what happens next is I'm gonna cook this down for just a little while longer, and when it gets to become a very heavy syrup, then I'll seed down the pan with uh, seed crystals. In other words, just regular table sugar. I sprinkle it in there. Um, 
within a fairly short time, a crystal mm -hmm. matrix will grow in that solution until the crystals have consumed the whole pan. So you notice that this pan has a, a different color. This is also a juicer product, but it has a lighter color. This is the one that came from the, the Scottish fodder beets. And um, it does have a less intrusive beet type flavor to it, but it's still um, not something you would necessarily want to put on your oatmeal. It's still a little bit too much beet in one place. And we wouldn't want to subject members of the public to uh, tasting the sugar to uh, solicit their opinion of it. We know well enough what the results are.